This week we're dealing with the West, as you know. I want to examine the conquest of the West, which is one of the most misunderstood periods in American history. I'll start by challenging some of the key myths that surround that history. I'll then discuss the great westward migration, detailing the motivations of millions of Americans to move west and their transformation of the region. And then I'll turn the, our attention to the central problem of westward expansion, the fact that hundreds of thousands of Native Americans already lived in the West and considered the land theirs. And finally, I'll look at the rest of the story, that is, how this era in American history is remembered. So let me start with myths of the West. There's probably no period in American history that in, has been more mythologized than the story of the settlement and development of the West. One of the key myths, right, very central, very important, about this period is that the West was a separate place. When most Americans think of pioneers heading West, they think of them crossing a boundary line, perhaps the Mississippi River, whereupon they left behind the United States and entered the West. According to this thinking, the West was unconnected to the great civilizations emerging in the East. But we don't have to look very hard to see how erroneous this view is. You know, a national telegraph and railroad network tied the West to the East. The great majority of economic activity in the West was also tied to markets in the East. A second myth about the West is that it was a place of rugged individualism with almost no government. Now, there are lots of ways in which I can chatter uh, this myth by showing you how uh, what facilitated westward migration and settlement. In 1862, Congress passed two laws that had great bearing on the West. The first was the Pacific Railway Act. It authorized and funded the building of the Transcontinental Railroad to open the West to settlement. In addition, the Homestead Act divided millions of acres of western land into 160-acre plots that settlers could acquire for free or for a very small fee. Further, the U.S. government stepped in to provide tens of thousands of soldiers to defeat Native Americans and remove them eventually to reservations. Another myth is that the West was settled primarily by white Americans, but in fact, an incredibly diverse array of people participated in the Great Migration to the West. There's another myth that holds that Western, uh, westward settlement unfolded like a carpet of civilization, moving from east to west and ending at the P Pacific Ocean. You see a lot of this in sort of uh, uh, graphics of the time. There were sort of, uh, you know, the kind of illustrations that people put out in the 1880s, 1890s. So the frontier was a clear line that retreated as settlement pushed further west. But once the gold rush began in 1849, the west coast, the west coast was rapidly settled, while the Great Plains in the middle and other interior spaces were settled later. Okay. Again, and there's another, another myth. There must be six or seven of these. The west was a simple place where men and women used their bare hands, a few, few tools, and maybe a horse and an ox to establish new lives. In other words, it was cut off from the emerging modern world of cities, electricity, and industrial machinery. Well, pioneers brought with them as much as the, of the modern world as they could. They brought factory-made tools and clothing and even canned food. And when they established themselves on farms, most settlers envisioned growing crops to sell on the market in other places, either further west into California or uh, the majority of them uh, uh, wanted to sell back east on the big eastern markets. Okay, In order to do this, in order to reach the kind of agricultural production they needed to reach, they purchased an essential piece of high-tech machinery, and that was the mechanical reaper. Okay. Uh, you see these now, the, the modern ones, big John Deere jobs, you know, they're huge and they, they, they can reap uh, acres and acres and acres. 
very quickly, but mechanical reapers started in this period and became very, very popular because they could pay for themselves within one season, and from there on out, it was, in theory, profit if everything else went out. All right. Okay, so one final myth I want to talk about is that the West uh, was a, you know, a conflict between Native Americans and white settlers and that that conflict was inevitable. However, in truth, when early white explorers established contact with Native American tribes, both groups tended to get along somewhat well. Not necessarily great all the time, but somewhat well. But they, those relationships fell apart only after white populations began to surge in very, very large numbers, and whites demanded more of Native Americans' traditional land. Okay, let me talk about the Western economy. One of the cornerstones, obviously, of the Western econ economy was farming. Because the late 19th century is heavily associated with rapid industrialization, rapid uh, urbanization, many people believe that agriculture in America necessarily declined, but that's not the case in this period. Between 1860 and 1900, the number of farms in the United States nearly tripled, growing from 2 million to 5.7 million. And the value produced by these farms more than doubled from 6.6 .6 million to 16.6, sorry, from 6.6 .6 billion to 16.6 .6 billion. Now, if we consider what modern industrialization involves, these numbers should come as no surprise. The millions of people who moved to industrial centers to work in factories and non-agricultural pursuits got their food from the growing farms, from the growing number of farms in the West. Now, of course, life for Western farmers wasn't easy. They faced innumerable challenges posed by the elements and by unstable commodities markets with prices for crops fluctuating wildly from year to year. And as a consequence, many farms failed, but enough survived to feed the booming American population. The second key element in the Western economy was mining. The first great mining boom occurred in California in 1849. The next one happened in 1859 when gold was discovered in Colorado and silver was discovered in Nevada. Mining booms followed a, a, a familiar pattern. An initial wave of small, independent prospectors collected in easy-to-find deposits near uh, the Earth's surface. They panned for gold in streams and, and small rivers. Then, more sophisticated, heavily capitalized mining operations would move in. They possessed the equipment and the know-how to bore deeply into the earth to extract massive amounts of gold, silver, and other materials, such as copper, such as lead, such as iron, coal. And we tend not to think of, of the West as having a lot of coal, but it does and did. And finally, zinc, right? A third, the third major industry to develop in the, in the West was ranching. Like farming and mining, it was also, also intimately tied to the modernization and industrialization of the American economy. For instance, when Texas entered the Union in 1845, it did so with millions of longhorn cattle. Mexicans and Americans raised these cattle primarily for their skin and their tallow, but as, as Americans began to eat more beef, ranchers realized that there were enormous profits to be made if they could get their cattle to northern markets. So in 1866, te Texas ranchers mounted the first or what were known as the Long Drives, encompassing more than 1,000 miles to Colorado. Soon, a second more prominent destination emerged in Abilene, Kansas, which was a stop on the Kansas Pacific Railroad, and by the late 1870s, more than 600,000 longhorns a year arrived, arrived in Abilene for sale and then were sent by railroad to Chicago for slaughter and redistribution. Okay. And, of course, you, you've seen these cattle drives in movies. You've seen them depicted in all sorts of ways. The key figure that we've come to know in, the, in these cattle drives was the cowboy who emerges the great, one of the great iconic figures of the American West. Now, of course, remember, the central problem of westward expansion was the fact that hundreds of thousands of Native Americans already lived there and considered the land theirs. 
1865, approximately 360,000 Native Americans lived in the Trans-Mississippi West. They were a remarkably diverse set of peoples, comprising something like 500 distinct tribes, each with its own language, its own religion, its own traditions. However, the world of the Native Americans entered a period of crisis as the flood tide of white, white migration began moving westward. Remember, it's really the flood of migration that makes things so much more difficult. Now, relations between whites and Native Americans had always been extremely complicated in American history, but they seemed to deteriorate into violence for one simple reason. Native Americans possessed lands that white Americans wanted. For the first 250 years of, the, of, of white settlement, and European settlement in, in North America, white, white Americans solved this problem by either killing Native Americans or driving them further westward. Well, they drove them further westward, then followed in westward expansion themselves. Now, to minimize conflict and maximize opportunities for white settlers, Congress eventually adopted new policies. In 1851, it established two Indian territories, one in Oklahoma and the other on the northern Great Plains. Under this law, which is the, called the First Treaty of uh, Fort Laramie, the U.S. government agreed to prevent white settlement in the territory while the Native Americans agreed to allow westward migrants to pass peacefully through. But the hope for peace you know, failed to materialize. Conflicts between whites and Native Americans in the West grew much more intense. At the Really at the center of this conflict was a mindset of superiority shared by most whites when it came to viewing Native Americans. Most saw Indians as backwards, that they, they were pagan, they were violent, they were savages. And because of their perceived lack of civilization, they couldn't make a rightful claim to the lands on which they lived. Many white officials, as evidenced by the many treaties they signed with Native Americans, honestly wanted to find a, a path to peaceful coexistence. But the attitudes of these officials and the treaties they produced had almost no impact on the run-of-the-mill migrants heading west. You know, the, these migrants routinely violated the terms of agreement, such as, the again, the Treaty of Fort Laramie, by, and they did it by settling on, on Indian land. This was especially true wherever gold or silver was found. But the federal government failed to enforce the terms of its own treaties by ejecting these white trespassers, frankly. Instead, federal authorities often demanded that Native American groups sign new agreements that reduced the size of their tribal lands. When the authorities couldn't get all the leaders of the tribal factions to sign, they accepted the signatures of a minority group and declared that the new treaty would be in force after all. This pattern became common practice in the West after the Civil War, and therefore, and thereafter, armed conflicts raged between settlers and Native Americans. In those conflicts, several factors really led to the doom of Native Americans and their way, way of life, including, by the way, disunity and the fact that in many cases, their battles with the U.S. Army were fought in close proximity to their entire communities, making women, children, and the elderly, you know, right there in the, or right very close to the center of battle. They were vulnerable to surprise attacks on their encampments. And further, Native Americans fought at a tremendously uh, a tremendous technological disadvantage to the American military. In the end, one by one, defeated tribes were removed from their tribal homelands and sent to reservations. Okay. Now, this, the, all of this kind of happens by the early 1880s. The last of the Indian Wars really takes place in 1883. And it's from 1883 onwards that we get a period that uh, the, the, what we might call the construction of the memory of the American West. Okay. 1883, the last of the Indian Wars moved to conclusion, and William Cody, also known as Buffalo Bill, launched an entertainment venture he called the Wild West. Now, it's very key to know this. It was not called the Wild West Show, even though lots of... He didn't call it the Wild West Show. He called it the Wild West. Now, essentially, it was a circus. Okay. 
Cody's entertainment troupe traveled the country presenting authentic, I'm putting authentic in quotation mark, cowboys and Indians reenacting scenes from history such as the cattle drives, Indian attacks on wagon trains, and Custer's last stand. Now, Buffalo Bill's Wild West became a sensation not only in the United States but around the world. And in the 1890s, um, let's see, 18, no, sorry, late 1880s and early 1890s, Buffalo, the Buffalo Bill's Wild West show played in London, was seen by Queen Victoria, and a young Winston Churchill, nine years old or ten years old, something, wrote to his mother begging to be taken to see, uh, to see the Wild West. Buffalo Bill's Wild West, but she didn't take him, and he was tremendously disappointed by that as a young man. So Buffalo Bill played a key role in shaping a mythical West in the American imagination. It was a place of heroism, individualism, and success, and these same things, the same themes were later picked up by Hollywood, by television, and by advertisers. Now, in recent decades, really since the, the late 80s, early 90s, a new Western history has emerged that seeks to present the West as more uh, of a complicated place. Okay, The new history takes into account the Native American perspective as well as the struggles and often the failures of whites who migrated West along with the role of big business and the effects of westward expansion on the, on the environment. So since the, 19, or since the early 1990s, this interpretation of Western history is now reflected in the way the story of the West is told, even in some Hollywood movies and television programs. It's very rare to find anything with that old mythological West in it when it comes to entertainment. Okay. Now, the image of the West still looms large in American imagination but these days it's still it's an image and more people have come to accept it as a myth and not very close to reality 